I'm Amy Goodman with Anjali Comet as we return to another excerpt from White Power USA by filmmakers Rick Rowley and Jackie Suin that aired in full on Al Jazeera English. If you look at the potential of violence and the history of violence, the potential is tremendous. Special Agent Bart McIntyre retired from the Federal Weapons Control Agency, the ATF, this January. As an undercover officer, he infiltrated a ring of white supremacist groups responsible for multiple murders. I mean, that was a belt buckle I would wear while we were undercover that we bought from one of the Klan rally sites. He sees a perfect storm of economic and political conditions driving a rise in white supremacist violence. The economics, Obama being the black president, the Democratic-controlled Congress, is all fueling the fires. The numbers may be small in the U.S., but, you know, there is a an event sitting out there that could spark the movement, and all of a sudden you could see those numbers increase exponentially. Special Agent McIntyre is not alone in his concern. Last spring, a U.S. Department of Homeland Security report warned that right-wing extremists are now, quote, the most dangerous domestic terrorism threat in the United States. The report's most disturbing findings concern the movement's attempt to recruit members inside the U.S. military, something that McIntyre witnessed firsthand while working undercover. I mean, we were dealing with soldiers there out of Columbus, Georgia, and they were stealing mil military guns and explosives off the military base there. Uh, they were supplying it to white supremacist organizations. Special Agent McIntyre fears that the country could return to the violence of the 90s, when decorated Gulf War veteran Timothy McVeigh bombed the Oklahoma Federal Building, killing 168 people. Someone's always looking to be the next martyr. A Timothy McVeigh could happen any day of any week. In December of 2008, Cody Brittingham, a Lance Corporal in the U.S. Marine Corps, was arrested for involvement in a string of armed robberies. In his barracks room, investigators found white supremacist material, a declaration that Barack Obama was a domestic enemy of America, and plans for Obama's assassination. At one point, death threats against President Obama were running at record levels, averaging 30 a day. These numbers have dropped off since their peak around the time of the election and inauguration. But law enforcement around the U.S. remains on its guard for violence from many corners of the white supremacist world. Gentlemen, where's your emergency? Somebody just came in and shot my daughter and my husband. They shot them? Please, mom, please. She's bleeding out of her phone. Please. How old is your daughter? She's 10. 10? Where were they shot? In the head. In the head. Are they still there, the people who are there that shot them? They're coming back in. They're coming back in. That was the night of May 30th, 2009, at this house in Arivaca, Arizona, where Raul Flores and his 10-year-old daughter, Brisania, were murdered. Their alleged killers were Shauna Ford, director of an anti-immigrant Minuteman militia, and her operations director, Jason Bush, who has been linked to the white supremacist Aryan nations. Ford talked of starting a revolution against the U.S. government, and they allegedly planned to rob Latinos they believe were drug dealers to finance their underground activities. The whole mindset of hate uh, under the guise of uh, fighting illegal immigration, something that we have not seen uh, probably since the 60s or 50s. Salvador Reza is a lifelong community organizer here in Arizona. He's been battling for years against the anti-immigrant and white supremacist groups that target Latinos in the state. Their little minds get to the point that they're fighting this battle against the invasion. And in essence, what they're doing is uh, creating the conditions for what happened here in this house. Like, I bet you that little girl laid in that trampoline. There have been nine high-profile murders by white supremacists since Obama's election and the pain in the communities they affect is visceral. But these crimes represent only a small part of the white nationalist movement's impact on America as a whole. We've got to look at a bigger picture than just the narrow problem of racist violence. There are constant pressure on the racial fault line in American life. They want to set dynamite on that fault line. Exploiting America's racial fault line helps white nationalists impact mainstream politics. It also helps conservative talk show hosts get viewers. This president, I think, has exposed himself as a guy over and over and over again who has a deep-seated hatred for white people or the white culture. This guy is, I believe, a racist. 
I feel like President Obama is just saying, you know what? <laughs> for years, the anti-immigration movement was the vehicle of choice for white nationalists looking for an impact on public policy. Why don't you just set us on fire? Do you not hear the cries of people who are saying, stop, all aboard the Tea Party? But since Barack Obama's election, conservative media figures have helped launch a new populist movement that white nationalists see as their best chance in decades to cross over into mainstream American politics. USA! 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 Calling themselves Tea Party Patriots and styling themselves as new American revolutionaries, conservative activists have descended by the thousands on town halls, state capitals, and on Washington, D.C. The Tea Party movement claims it has nothing to do with racism. But at rallies across the country, race is never far below the surface. Coming to a clinic near you. And I think the guy's a racist. I mean, he, you know, he, he's talking about how he's going to bring this country together. If he gets us any more together, we're going to kill each other. What's the difference between the Cleveland Zoo and the White House? Stop me. The zoo has an African lion, and the White House has a lion African. <laughs> but do you think Obama is a real American? No, I do not. I do believe that he's trying to change the country in his own image, whatever his image is. A number of white nationalists noticed the Tea Party phenomenon and said, this is something we have to get into on their websites and in other venues. And they started to talk about what they needed to do to push the envelope. The Council of Conservative Citizens is perhaps the largest and most influential white nationalist group pushing the envelope. The council keeps its membership secret but counts elected officials among its ranks. It has dozens of chapters across the United States, many of which have organized tea parties. The organization is the descendant of the white citizens councils formed to combat the civil rights movement and preserve segregation. Today, its website identifies the United States as a Christian and European nation and opposes integration and race mixing. What's a racist? And I'm not sure what the term means even that you're proud of what you are? Well, everybody, I guess, is a racist of some sort. Gordon Baum was part of the White Citizens Councils in the 60s. Today, he is the Council of Conservative Citizens Director. Our nose is being rubbed into the fact that Obama's black, and we better all recognize the fact that he's a black man, and he's our president, and Mr. White American, you're going to have your nose rubbed in it, and we can do what we want, and we're going to give ourselves all kind of goodies. The last year has been probably our most dramatic in growth because people are really upset with the direction this country's taken, and we're getting lots of young people, a lot of veterans coming back from Iraq and uh, Afghanistan that want something done before it's too late. Let's look at the counselor of the Citizens Council of Louisiana. Martin Luther King, a troublemaker, a liar. Chipperlay runs Political Research Associates, which has been tracking the Citizens Council since the 60s. He sees a continuum between the overt racial appeals of the past and the Tea Party rallying cries today. The kind of naked white supremacy that you see in the pages of the counselor um, are uh, no longer acceptable. And so you develop other ways, coded language, essentially. There's three words you need to sing with me. And those three words are, take it back. Take it back. Take our country back. Take our country back. Now, what could that possibly mean? Well, our country is a white Christian nation. And the more we diluted our America with those other people, uh, the less it was going to be America. And the idea is always that we have to take back our America from them. And you never have to say them, because the only people being addressed when you say take back America are white people. At tea parties across the country, it is impossible not to notice that the audience is always almost entirely white. They bring, invite black speakers to it in hopes of attracting blacks and Hispanics, and for some reason they just turn their back on it and they're not interested. Gordon Baum says African Americans don't come to the tea parties because black culture is less democratic than white culture. It's a chief mentality. If the, Obama's the boss, and that's it. Gordon Baum put us in touch with Brian Pace, the regional organizer for the Council of Conservative Citizens in northern Mississippi, 
where tea parties have helped with recruiting. In addition to our Mississippi website, it's been put online. Uh, in July, we've had over 17,000 people come to it. Just like we put another website online called white-pride.org, and it's getting flooded with uh, responses. It's nonstop. Pace is busy setting up new chapters around the state and runs a side business selling Confederate and white pride stickers and pins, including many with slogans we had seen at tea party protests across the country. When Pace canvasses for new recruits, he starts the conversation on the economy. 